Now we can clearly see that katagraphe, according to the writings, means based upon the writings, or another way to put it, as we learn from the writings. God was revealing Jesus to the entire world through the prophetic writings, the Jewish scriptures, and not some ground zero event just a few years earlier. An ancient mystery encoded into the very pages of scripture, hidden from mankind since the beginning of time, revealed only in the last days to select apostles such as Paul. Paul's Jesus was revealed to him via the pages of Jewish scripture. This idea of Paul seeing Jesus in the passages of Jewish scripture with no mention or hint of an earthly Jesus will be a crucial part of the solution to this resurrection passage, as I will continue to show. Now I want to explore two different explanations, either of which will remove this idea that Paul is referring to an earthly Jesus physically appearing to hundreds of people after his resurrection. Let's quickly revisit the passage. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain until now, but some are fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to the child untimely born, he appeared to me also. Now, a few things before we get to the two explanations I talked about. Let's assume that these verses were actually written by Paul and that he actually meant a physical appearance by Jesus. Even if this is the case, at best what we have here is hearsay by a man almost 2,000 years removed about an event so unlikely that we would never believe it outside of a religious context. Obviously, Paul did not personally see Jesus appearing to all the people mentioned here. We have no way to verify that Jesus appeared in physical form to anyone that Paul lists in this passage. It's Paul's word against mine. So even if I stopped here, we'd have nothing more than unbelievable and uncorroborated hearsay. But of course I'm not going to stop here. I'm having too much fun. But if we consider this passage to be written by Paul, and Jesus did physically appear to him after his resurrection, then we have a problem. Paul is claiming that Jesus appeared to him in the same manner as he appeared to all the others listed. There is no differentiation, no qualification. The same Greek word is used in each verse for the word appeared, which is horao. And as a result, we have a Jesus who stayed on earth for several years after his resurrection in order to appear to Paul, who wasn't converted until many years after Jesus' resurrection. You see, Paul admits to persecuting Christians and interestingly, he refers to the movement as a church, which would seem to indicate a time well beyond Jesus' resurrection. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. It would take years before Christianity would become noticed at all by the Jewish establishment as most Jews rejected the idea and as such it would have spread at a snail's pace during its inception. In fact, Josephus, born in 37 CE and writing just a few years after the Jewish-Roman War of 72 CE, never even mentioned the Christian sect in his two writings, Antiquities of the Jews and Jewish War, even though he mentions several other sects and a couple of other Jesuses. Christianity was simply not off the ground until closer to the end of the first century. However, the idea of Jesus hanging around on earth for several years, then appearing to Paul directly, contradicts the Gospels and Acts, which show Jesus ascending back into heaven at various times, but no later than 40 days after his resurrection, according to Acts. 
to whom he also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So we have an irreconcilable problem if Paul actually wrote the verses in question intending to mean a physical appearance by Jesus. But if Paul never believed Jesus was on earth, perhaps the passage was inserted later by a more orthodox Christian. Since the New Testament manuscripts have been heavily altered and added to over time, it makes good sense to ask whether this passage also might be a later insertion into Paul's original letter. Nowhere else in Paul's letters does he include any historical details that place Jesus on planet Earth. He never mentions Jesus actually doing anything or teaching anything as we find in the Gospels. Yes, there are a few enigmatic phrases that seem to speak of a human Jesus and a few later insertions that Paul never wrote, but nothing explicitly linking the Jesus of Paul to that of the Gospels. This alone would be sufficient to raise suspicion that Paul isn't the one speaking here. Perhaps this is the voice of a later Orthodox author who felt the need to shore up the claim of Jesus' resurrection. According to the author, Jesus supposedly appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve, an obvious reference to the Twelve disciples we learn about in the Gospels. But Jesus could not have appeared to Twelve disciples. Judas died before Jesus' resurrection, and Matthias was not chosen to replace him until after Jesus had ascended back up into heaven. Jesus could only have appeared to eleven disciples. This is corroborated by Matthew 28 and Luke 24. Another point is that nowhere in Paul's letters, or the other epistles for that matter, is the word disciple used in reference to Jesus' immediate followers. No knowledge of any disciples is shown by Paul anywhere in his writings. Another oddity here is that Cephas is counted separately from the twelve disciples. And so is James. Yet, if Cephas is just another name for the Peter of the Gospels, then why list him separately from the twelve disciples? And the same could be said for James. Could it be possible that Cephas was not the Peter of the Gospels, and that this James was not James the brother of John, as we learn about from the Gospels? Or is it possible that the author who inserted this was unaware that Cephas was Peter. More on this later. The Gospels certainly depict James, John, and Peter as the big three disciples, but Paul mentions James, John, and Cephas as the big three. So perhaps Cephas is Peter after all. Cephas in Aramaic means stone or rock. But wait a minute. If it were only that simple. Peter, in Acts chapter 10, is shown a vision of which is his initiation into preaching to the Gentiles. Yet, Paul claims that this Cephas fellow, along with John and James, were to preach to the Jews, not the Gentiles. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised, that is, the Gentiles, had been committed to me, Paul, as the gospel for the circumcised, the Jews, was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Paul tells us no less than three different times that Peter, or Cephas, was commissioned by God to preach to the Jews and Paul to the Gentiles. Someone isn't telling us the truth here, and my hunch is that it's the author of Acts. The oddity here, of course, is that Paul mentions Peter and Cephas 
in the span of two verses. Why would he do that if Cephas was Peter? The name Cephas only appears in 1 Corinthians and Galatians, and once in the Gospel of John, which appears to be a later merging of Paul's use of Cephas with the other Gospel's use of Peter. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, So you are Simon, the son of John? You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Oddly, every time Jesus or John references Cephas after that point, he isn't called Cephas, but Peter or Simon Peter. If Jesus and his disciples spoke Aramaic, why would Jesus continue to call him Petros from that point forward, a Greek word for rock, instead of Cephas, as he said he would call him? Fiction and later insertions keep rearing their ugly heads.